Rev students, how are we? Y'all doing all right? All right. Um, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn it to Matthew 28. That's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time tonight. Uh, my name is Chris. If you don't know who I am or how I got here, I'm supposed to be here. And uh, I'm, if, if tonight's your first night, I want to say welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I know we've had a lot of new people lately. And, uh, but if, if you haven't been here or if you're just coming back after being gone for a little while, you're kind of coming in almost at the end of our series that we've been calling Paradigm, right? And as I'm sure you know, a paradigm is just uh, a standard or, or a framework. And so what we've been talking about in this series is <clears throat> part of the framework of Christianity. We call those doctrines. And I, in case you don't know, uh, Christianity is not just a framework, okay? It's not just a set of beliefs. It's not just a set of doctrines. Christianity primarily is a relationship with God because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. But just like any relationship that you guys are in, whether that's with your parents or with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your teachers, um, any particularly meaningful relationship, it has to operate within a set of boundaries, right? And so when you operate within a set of boundaries in a relationship, then the relationship is healthy, it thrives. But if you operate outside of those boundaries, well, then it's destructive to the relationship, right? And in that sense, it's, it's very similar with Christianity and with our relationship with God. That when we talk about what we believe, it is to enhance our relationship with God. Um, it's not following rules. It's not, you know, limiting ourselves. It's so that we can know God better and know who he's called us to be, what he's made us to be. And so that's why we've been talking about these, these things that make up the framework of Christianity. And so we talked about the, the authority of Scripture We've talked about sin and the fall. We talked about spiritual warfare. Ooh, spooky, you know. And then last week, we talked about the resurrection, which is the hinge point uh, of Christianity. That's the hinge point of our faith. Everything rises and falls on the resurrection. And if that's the case, if that's true, and it is, but if that's, if that's true, then that compels us uh, compels out of us a response. And that response is actually a command for Je from Jesus. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And so that's where we're going to be in Matthew 28. But before we get to Matthew 28, I want to go back to the beginning of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 1, and that's where an angel shows up to Joseph and, and gives him this prophecy of Jesus' birth, right? And when he gives him this prophecy and he tells him about Jesus, he said he's going to save people from their sins, and then he reaches back, uh, Matthew reaches back as, as, uh, to confirm this prophecy. He reaches back to a prophecy from Isaiah 7. And here's what the prophecy from Isaiah 7 says. It's Matthew 1, verse 23. It says, behold, and I love that word, by the way, behold. I'm always, every time I read it, every time I'm up here and preaching it, I probably say it all the time, just the word itself, I just love it. It's very powerful to me emotionally, and so it's just like, Take it in, you know, marvel at what you're about to see, you know, behold, I just, I just love that word. It says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Oh, that's impossible. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's the prophecy from Isaiah. And the reason I even start there instead of going ahead and diving into Matthew 28 is that before there was a resurrected Savior, there was a baby born in a major, right? And that if that's true, then that means, if the resurrection's true, that means the birth is true. And if that's true, that means this is not just in a galaxy far, far away, right? This is not wishful thinking. This is not once upon a time. That our faith is not just some good story. But like Jeremy talked about last week with the resurrection, this is historical reportage. That this was an event that happened. And if that's the case, then that should move something in us to respond to. Because at the center of history is a cross and an empty tomb. And we have to do something with that, particularly if we accept it. So let's jump ahead to Matthew 28. We're going to start in verse 18. And this is what Matthew says. He says, Jesus came and he's around his disciples and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so he, he comes out and he's about, he's about to go to heaven. He's about to ascend to heaven. And he, he, he establishes the directive that he's about to give us. 
He gives us this foundation to build off of the command that he's about to give us. And the, the foundation is, I have all the authority. I, if you go to heaven, where God is, I have the authority. If you stay here on earth, where you are, I have the authority. I am in charge wherever you go. My name is Jesus, and I am the boss. I am the master. I am the Lord. And that word Lord, sometimes, I don't know if you notice it, if you read the Bible on your own, but sometimes it's like capital L, but like lowercase the rest of the letters, and then sometimes it's like all caps. And, you know, the, the first one is just kind of Jesus saying, hey, listen, I am over all of this stuff. I am the master of all of it. I'm the master of your spiritual life, all that kind of stuff. But the one that's all caps is particularly significant because that is God's covenant name that he gave to Moses. Yeah, that's the name Yahweh. And that name was, was considered so holy to the Jewish people, they wouldn't even speak it. And when they put it in the Bible, they wouldn't even put it. They'd put that capital L-O-R-D so that they wouldn't have to, to write it. And if they ever did get the courage to write it down, they would just write the first letter, and then they would draw a line, and then they would burn the pen. Okay, that's, that's how distinct God is and was to them. And so Jesus is saying, that's me. I am the Lord in heaven and on earth. I am in charge. That is our foundation tonight. So he says, all right, I am the Lord. Every, everything is under my command. I'm in charge of it all. And then in verse 19, he says, therefore go, I switched the words around, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So he says, I'm in charge. And how do you know I'm in charge? Because of the resurrection. The resurrection establishes that everything I said about myself is true. And he says, because of that, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, and so go. Now, last night as I was thinking through this, I was going over this, and, and I didn't even put it in my notes because I'm like, I can't, like, this is another sermon. So if you, if you come back for my next, you know, Great Commission sermon, this is what it'll be about. But I just had to talk about it because it just kind of got me excited a little bit. And so I was thinking through like this, that, that command go, and it hit me that God is, this is not the first time that God's spoken like this. Back in Genesis 12, he comes to Abram, if you know this story. <clears throat> Abram eventually becomes Abraham. He's the father of great, you know, the great, uh, you know, the fa father of our faith. He's our, the, the, the start of our faith. Father Abraham, you may have heard that song. And he, he, there's this thing called the Abrahamic covenant. It's a promise that God makes to Abraham because Abraham and Sarah couldn't have children. And he comes to him and he says, listen, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to start with you and, and Sarah. And then from there on, I'm just gonna, it's going to explode. And, you know, I'm going to establish my name with you. And the, the promise is... Um, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I am going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And I, through your people, everyone in the world is going to be blessed. That's the Abrahamic covenant, which is, you know, fantastic on its own. But right before that, he says to Abram, go. He says, Abram, go, leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. And then you skip over to Hebrews 11.8. The author of Hebrews says, and so Abraham went not knowing where he was going. He just, he just started out. And so I can only imagine Abram going, okay, well, I'm, you told me to go, so I'm going to go. I'm going to start going this way, but like, where am I going? And God says, don't worry, I'll, I'll show you when you get there. And so Jesus comes along and says kind of the same thing. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And so in a similar way, the disciples and you and me, probably too, can say, okay, well, where do you want us to go? And instead of God saying, I'll show you later, just go. It's a distinct place. God just says, everywhere. I want you to go to all the nations. I want you to go to every people group. I want you to go to everybody. And this is particularly fascinating to me because go obviously is an active command. That is you getting out of your comfort zone. That is you walking forward. That is you doing something. It's not passive. It's not everybody come to me and then I'll, you know, let you know what you need to know. It's, Jesus is like, no, I want you to go. And the reason that this is pretty fascinating to me is because, you know, Jewish, the Jewish faith is not a proselytizing religion. If you know anything about it, I don't know too much about it, uh, only what's part of our faith, but it's not, they're not out there trying to get more Jews, okay? 
And the reason why is because, you know, if you read the story of Abram and on, the Jewish faith was almost exclusively for the Jewish people. So it was a race or an ethnic group, and it was also a faith. And they went together almost exclusively with very few exceptions. And so, you know, they didn't have to proselytize because if you're part of the Jewish people, you're part of the Jewish faith generally. And so they're not going, hey, I I don't know what race you are, but you want to come be a Jew? They're like, no, well, if you're not, are you Jewish? Then you can be a Jew. You know, that was just how they did it. That's why they didn't go, they weren't recruiting people to be Jewish. And here comes Jesus, and he's like, I want you to go. And, you know, I was pretty sure that Matthew was Jewish, and, but I was like, let me just double check. And so I said, it was Matthew Jewish. I Googled it. And, and the response from Google was, Matthew is the most Jewish book of the Gospels. It's the most Jewish gospel, gospel. And so Matthew points this out here. He's saying, hey, listen, this is different than what we're, what we're used to because not only is it not passive, but it's for all nations. And so that's, that's one of the things that I want us to know tonight, if you don't know it, is that God's love, it's not solely for one people, but for the whole world. It's not solely for one race, but for the whole world. It's not so, solely for one um, social class, but for the whole world. It's not just one kind of person, but it's for every kind of person. Everyone is invited to the family of God. And so when, if you ever hear people talk on these verses, this is called the Great Commission. It is Jesus' last command before he ascends into heaven, and it is, you guys go. And if you ever hear people talking about it, a lot of times, this is the launch pad for a, a sermon or a talk on overseas missions, right? And, uh, you know, and that's, that is a right way to read that verse. It is a good launch pad to, to talk about overseas missions. And, um, but it doesn't have to talk about overseas missions. And don't hear, don't hear me say that that's not important, okay? Because the Garcia family is heavily involved in overseas missions, both financially and a big part of our soul is like, like the most intimate thing my family does is with overseas missions. And so that is a great thing if you ever have the opportunity to go go. If you ever have opportunity to be a part, like you stay, but you, you know, finance it or something like that, absolutely. Be as involved in taking the gospel, taking the light to dark places as you possibly can be. But it doesn't have to mean, oh, this means you need to go overseas, because the world is a lot more global now. Do you know that? Back in this time, you know, if they wanted to go to China, that's like a lifetime, <laughs> You know, that's, that's months and months, like, trying to get there, and you can't just call mom when you get there and let her know you're okay. Like, this was, it was a big world, and the world's gotten a lot smaller. So everything is globalized with, with the ease of travel. It's so easy to get places with, you know, I can call somebody and be face-to-face with them right now in Scotland if I wanted to, because just the world and technology is just that small. Back in this day, the whole world doesn't shut down if there's a virus coming from China. You know, we know that the world can be very, very small very, very quickly. And so for them, when Jesus says what he says, go to all nations, that means something a little bit differently to them, or it can mean something a little bit differently to them than it does to us. And so to condense it for us, he says, go and make disciples wherever you are, okay? Go and make disciples wherever you are and wherever you're going. Look at what he says next, and or this is not Matthew. We're going to skip over to Acts chapter one, verse eight. This is Jesus again, and he's about to ascend into heaven. So he's right around the exact same time, and he says, "But you and I will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon us, and you and I will be my witnesses," says Jesus, "in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth." Now again, he's speaking to them very specifically, and he's speaking to them very specifically geographically. There's a real place called Jerusalem. There's a real place called Judea and Samaria, right? And so we go, okay, well, that, we can't just look at that and go, well, that was for them because I'm not in Jerusalem. The principle is for us is that when he says Jerusalem, that means where they already were, right? And the same command is to us as well. Where you already are, go. 
You know, this is your family, this is your friends, this is your gymnastics team, this is the place where you work. Wherever you are and wherever you are going, make disciples. It could almost be read, instead of go make disciples, it could be as you go, make disciples. And so there's the first place. If we're looking, you know, if we're going, well, I can't leave today to go to China, what can I do? As you go, make disciples. But then he says, Judea and Samaria. Okay, well, what does that mean to us? Judea was, if you look at a map, there's Jerusalem, and then there's Judea on the bottom. It's the, the surrounding area in the south, and then there's Samaria on the top, or to the north, the surrounding area of Jerusalem. And so Judea to us, because we're not in Jerusalem, Judea to us is where you are, but just expanding the circle a little bit. Maybe it's not people that you know, maybe it's people where you are that you don't know. Right, so this is, you know, Pick, almost a Cherokee County, Pickens County. This is Jasper. This is your school. This is your neighborhood, and particularly, the people that are in darkness the most. And so, I'm when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about the poor. I'm thinking about the oppressed. I'm thinking about orphans and widows. I'm thinking about foster care people who think they don't have a family. The invitation is, you have a family. Be a part of our family. And so that's people that you know, but, or people that you, the, where you are, but that you don't know. But then he, more interestingly, he says, and Samaria. Now, what's particularly fascinating to me about Samaria, if you know, you know, if you read the, the Gospels, Jesus a lot of times uses Samaria as an example. And the reason for that is not because they were his favorite, or not because they were, you know, the Jews' favorite people. It was the opposite. They were enemies. They, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. In fact, there was this really like racist term that the Jews would use to describe the Samaritans. They would call them half-breeds. And the reason they said this is because when Assyria conquered Israel, what they would do and what was kind of common when you conquered a nation is you would send, you, know, you would take their best people and you would bring them back to your capital and you would train them in the ways of your culture, which was a pagan culture. But what they would also do is they would take their people and, and settle them in Israel. And so what would happen is when you settle them, you know, get those two people groups together, they would marry, they would have families, they would have children. And remember, the Jewish faith is almost exclusively for the Jewish people. And so the Jews would look at the Samaritans and call them these names and almost like to say, you're not really Jewish because now you're linked to Gentiles and we hate Gentiles. And so Jesus says, go, go into Jerusalem where you are, where your family is, where your job is, but also go into Judea and Samaria. So not just people you don't know, but people you don't even like. Jesus says, go there and build relationships. Go there and bring a light. Go there and make disciples, Jesus says. And so like, what that means is, you know, I, I, I was going to use the term enemy, but I have to put enemy in quotation marks because we don't really have, like, not really enemies. You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of times I think our enemies are people that, like, we're jealous of or people that um, a lot of times, especially when you get to be an adult, we still kind of act like children because we'll, we'll make our enemies the other political party. So what we'll say, oh, I hate them because they are Republicans, or I'll hate them because they are Democrats. And if that's, if that is, if that, if you ever hear, like, if that ever becomes you, like, just get off of, stop watching the television shows you're watching, stop paying attention to the social media you're paying attention to, that is, that is not good, that is not helpful, and that is, that is not appropriate for Christians, you should never hate someone because of their political affiliation. You should never hate someone because of, of um, you know, their, their sexual ethic. You should never hate someone because of their, even their religious affiliations. The other day, maybe about a week ago, I was, uh, I was at my house, and uh, I get a knock on the door. You know, maybe you guys have had this happen to you before. And so I go, I open the door, and I'm incredibly busy. It's a busy work day. I'm just trying to get things done. And there's two young ladies, just a little bit older than you guys, and they said, hey, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
And I was like, oh, I don't, don't have time right now. So I told them, I said, listen, I'm incredibly busy right now, but I said, I would love to talk to you. Can you come back at some, time, uh, at some point? And I will, I will sit down and listen. And they said, sure. When, and we, we set a time. They showed up on a Friday afternoon, and it was a little frustrating because I had to take a shower. And I don't know if you can tell, I don't like taking showers. And so I was like, man, I got to shower for this. I got to get prepared for this. And so they showed up, super nice people. And I, you know, we, we sat on my front porch. And I don't know if you know anything about what they believe, but it's different than what we believe. And so we sat there, and I, they said, we would love to tell you about our church. And I said, okay. And now... Anybody who knows me knows that I'm an arguer, I'm a debater, I love, I love challenging people's beliefs, not I mean, Christians mainly, but like anybody's, I just want to, I want people to think for themselves, I'm very big on that, and so I know that about me, right, and I know that's a little bit combative, and so I don't know if it was the spirit pressing in on me, or if it was just me just knowing who I am, and I'm going, I, I don't need to be like that, and so I was determined, I was like, I am not arguing, I am not debating, I'm not trying to convince, I'm just building a relationship. And so that's what it was for 45 minutes. They said, we would love to tell you about our church. I said, yes, please tell me about your faith. And then they said, well, what, you know, can you tell us about you? And I told them about Jesus. And it wasn't a, I didn't, I wasn't condescending. I wasn't, I didn't say, well, if you weren't stupid, you would know that. Like, I didn't start any sentences like that. I just talked to them like normal people. And this is, it's not quite this, but they're kind of Samaritans to me, you know? They are different than me, and they are trying to convince me of something that pulls me away from the Jesus of the Bible. And yet, and listen, I don't know what, I don't know what, if that was beneficial in any way. I don't know if I, if, you know, me being cordial and nice and loving to them and, you know, opening up my home to them and being and listening to them did anything. But I do know that they're coming back on Wednesday to talk to me again. And you know what? Maybe they go, man, we almost had them. Maybe if we just have another, another meeting, maybe we'll get them this time. I don't know what they're thinking, but I do know that they're human beings and Jesus loves them. And Jesus loves them probably more than he loves me because they seem like better people. And why would I look down my nose at them and call them whatever is the equivalent to half-breeds? Why can't I just build a bridge, build a relationship, tell them to come back? That's how I ended it. I said, you guys are welcome over here at any time. Please come back. And so when Jesus says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, I kind of think he means that. People who you, you're not like. Maybe you don't like them or maybe you're just not like them. And Jesus says, those people make disciples. Those people love. Those people go to. And then he says, to the ends of the earth. And you know, for us, it's pretty simple to get to the ends of the earth. I don't know if you know that. Like, it's a 12-hour it's a plane ride, at, you know, to somewhere. And you're there. You're at the end. And so for us, it doesn't mean go to the ends of the earth necessarily physically. It just means don't stop. It means go to wherever. It means go to whoever. It means just continue to go. Don't go, you know what, I've done enough. No, you'll know you've done enough when you're walking through the gates of heaven. That's when you've done enough, quote unquote. So he says, go all these places and then he says in verse 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I, 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 um, what I, only thing I want to say there is that this is a very clear picture of the Trinity, which is another doctrine of Christianity. And it's a doctrine that separates us from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I only say that because that was my example, right? This is something that is within the framework of Christianity. And I know he's not talking about three different persons or three different gods here because he says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not the names. He's saying in the name. And so Jesus is saying, I love the Father. The Father loves me. We love each other by the Spirit. That's the kind of loving relationship that we have and that we've always had. And the only reason that we, we've just decided to expand the circle to everyone else because we have so much love that we want to share it. 
And when you feel that love, you'll want to share it too. And so it's twofold. It's invitation into the family, but also when he says baptizing them in the name of, that means in, with the same authority. And so Jesus says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, and I'm delegating some of that authority to you. To do what? To make disciples, to expand the circle, to bring them into the family, to invite them into the family, because you have been adopted into the family. And Jesus says, I'm, allowing, I'm giving you some authority to do the same thing to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And look at verse 20, he says, what does that mean to make a disciple? It means to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Well, what did Jesus command us to do? Jesus commanded us to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to repent and believe the gospel, to take up your cross, and to follow him, meaning to count whatever it's going to cost you and follow Jesus. And another command is to go, right? Go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so our main point for tonight is this, is that God wants to use us so that we know that we are useful and wanted. God wants to use us to let us know that we are useful and wanted, that we have a purpose in this family. If you believe it, maybe, it's, maybe you don't believe it, but you should know that you're a part of a family and that God wants you here and that he has a purpose and a plan for you and he has things for you to contribute to the family because you're a part of it. You're not a chair sitting off in the corner. You're not a TV on the wall. You are a part of the family. And then he ends it with verse 20, and he says, and behold. There's my word. I love that word. And behold, and take it in, and just marvel at the majesty of what you're seeing, and just take it in. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's the same thing that we talked about in Matthew 1. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a, to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with you, God with us. And Jesus says, Behold, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And that is the encouragement, and that is the empowerment to go. Because our faith is not a stagnant faith. It's not a dead faith. It's not a, a still faith. It is a faith that goes. It is a faith that is rooted in history. Sometimes we go, we've heard this story before. We know the story of the cross. We know the story of Easter Sunday. I know there's a bunny rabbit in there somewhere, I think. I know that story. And we don't sit back and go, no, this happened. And I am changed. It is something that has been done for you. And that's good news. Because if it was up to us to earn it, we wouldn't. We couldn't, even if we wanted to. But the truth is, we wouldn't even want to. Some of us are Christians now, and we still don't care. We still struggle to live the life that God has called us to live, and not least of which is, has a microphone right now. So we wouldn't want to. That's what Pastor Jason's been talking about the past few weeks if you come here on Sunday mornings. Is that even if we could, we wouldn't. But because of who Jesus is, because he was crucified for our sins, and just as important because he was raised to life by the power of God, we are also raised to life in him. That's what the baptizing is to identify in his death, to identify in his burial, but also to identify in his resurrection. To identify in his death means that we die to who we were. If John Foreman were singing it, he'd say, I am the second man. Or 
I am the second woman. I am the one. I'm not my old me. I'm now my new me. But also, not just to die to our old selves, but to live as a new person. And because of that, we can't help but go and tell. Tell about the wonderful things that he's done. Tell about the wonderful God that he is, if you believe that. And we can do this because Jesus is our Emmanuel. God with us forever, even to the very end. And so because of this, I want you and me and all of us collectively and individually to take seriously this commission from Jesus that we call the Great Commission. That God empowers us by the Holy Spirit to go and take this disciple-making witness as far as we can to whoever we can. And so that's what I leave tonight. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because Jesus is with us always. Let me pray for you.